Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Menken. I'm the executive director of the Adam Smith Society, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event cast, Opportunity and Race, the Role of Capitalism. Before we begin, I do just want to wish everyone a happy Veterans Day uh, here at the Adam Smith Society. We do have a lot of members who have served in the military and continue to serve. So I really just want to extend a heartfelt thank you for your service and sacrifice to our country. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful Veterans Day. The Adam Smith Society's mission is to, promote, is to promote debate and discussion around the moral, social, and economic benefits of capitalism. If you're not already a member, please visit us at adamsmithsociety.com or reach out to one of your student chapter leaders um, if you're at one of our MBA student chapters. For our student members out there, I want to remind you that the Adam Smith Society does not end with business school. It's something you can be a part of throughout your career to stay connected to free market ideas, industry leaders, and each other in our professional network throughout the U.S. and, in fact, the world. Tonight's event cast is hosted by our student chapters at the MIT Sloan School of Management, Boston University Questrom Business School, and Dartmouth Tuck Business School. Representing MIT Sloan is Stephen DeSantis. Dartmouth Tuck is Joe Gladow. Uh, the BU Questrom chapter is Tim Song. And please note this event is being recorded. After after introduction, we'll have a 30 to 35 minute moderated discussion with our speakers, followed by questions from our three student chapter representatives. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn the show over for our first introduction, Dr. Larry, over to uh, Steve Sanders at MIT. Thanks, Steve, for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve DeSantis, and I'm co-president of the Adam Smith Society at the MIT Sloan School of Management. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Glenn Lowry, who is the Morton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Economics Department at Brown University and a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. His research focuses on, on applied microeconomic theory, game theory, industrial organization, natural resource economics, and the economics of race and inequality. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences the Econometric Society, and a member of the American Philosophical Society. A prominent social critic and public intellectual, Dr. Lowry has published more than 200 essays and reviews in journals of public affairs in the US and abroad, and hosts the popular podcast, The Glenn Show. You can follow him on Twitter at Glenn Lowry. Welcome, Dr. Lowry. Thanks, Steve. And my name is Joe Glado. I am one of the co-chairs at uh, the Adam Smith Society for the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College. And I'm pleased to introduce Jason Riley. Jason Riley is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal. After joining the journal in 1994, he was named a senior editorial writer in 2000 and a member of the editorial board in 2005. Jason writes opinion pieces on politics, economics, and education, immigration, and race. He is the author of numerous books, including Let Them In, The Case for Open Borders in 2008, Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, and his most recent book, False Black Power. Welcome, Jason Riley. Thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Song. I am chapter president at uh, BU Questrom School of Business, uh, and I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Raphael Mangual, um, who is a senior fellow and deputy director of legal policy at an institute, as well as a contributing director uh, of the City Journal. Raphael has written widely on urban crime, policing, and the criminal justice system. His work has been featured and mentioned in a wide variety of publications including the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, The New York Post, The Washington Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, and City Journal. In 2020, he was appointed to serve a four-year term as a member of the New York State Advisory Committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. You can follow Raphael on Twitter at Rafa underscore Mengual. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Raphael, who will moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you so much for joining us.
Well, thank you so much, Tim, for that wonderful introduction um, and for the Adam Smith Society for putting this event together. Um, and so I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, gentlemen, we are here to discuss opportunity, race, and capitalism. Now, you know, even to this day, when I hear the word capitalism, I think of really kind of romantic success stories. Uh, you know, I think of my own grandfather who immigrated from the Dominican Republic in the 1960s, opened up his own business in uh, Manhattan and, and became, uh, a, you know, a pretty relatively wealthy man. Um, but there's another side uh, to capitalism that uh, I think a lot of people are beginning to feel uh, does not get enough attention. Uh, and that's the racial wealth gap. Uh, and I want to just start off with just a couple of top line statistics and, 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 and get your thoughts on this. The median white family in the United States has about $171,000 in accrued wealth. This is assets minus debt. The median black family, on the other hand, has accrued wealth of just $17,600. And this is a gap that seems to be growing today. Now, land ownership seems to be at the, at the center of that, that wealth gap uh, because home equity accounts for typically about two thirds of the family's wealth. Um, and of course, home ownership is much less common in the black community as opposed to the white community. And so, you know, when you hear statistics like that, um, I, I'm gonna start with you, Glenn. When you see those numbers, do you, do you see a problem? And if so, what is that problem? Well, um, the numbers are stark. Uh, I could quibble about the measurement. You're looking at median. We have the whole distribution. So uh, the uh, statistic of the median might not be the most accurate way of comparing. Uh, there are a lot of people with negative net wealth, so you, that needs to be taken into account. Um, obviously, the disparity reflects the cumulative consequences of people starting out with less and then being able to acquire and save less over the course of their lifetimes. Home ownership is a part of that. Um, a problem, well, there are a lot of disparities. Uh, what's the relative wealth of Jewish Americans compared to Irish descended Americans or Italian descended Americans, for example? To say it's a problem is to imply that there's some cause of the disparity which is itself illegitimate. Um, I assume this argument goes back to slavery and it talks about the fact that blacks start out with less because they were dispossessed of their labor. Um, I think that's a relatively weak argument in the sense that slavery was a long time ago and wealth is a dynamic process that reflects people's business activity, their creation of wealth that doesn't fall from the sky and so on. So I didn't really answer your question. You asked me to what extent was it a problem? I tend to think the problem is overstated. I mean, I don't, certainly don't blame the disparity in wealth between blacks and whites on capitalism. That would be like blaming the disparity in health between blacks and whites on the American Medical Association. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not as uh, exercised about this disparity as a reflection of some deep problem in American society as many others are. So what about you, Jason? I mean, you know, is Glenn onto something? Is this, is this something we ought not to have our backs up about very much? Or is there a deep concern here when you, when you look at some of these top line disparities? I think I, I largely agree with what uh, Professor Lowry said. Um, it, it's not something that I'm particularly concerned about. Um, and I, I'd like to step back a little bit and, and, and look at the question a different way and say, um, why, why would you expect evenness in outcomes? Where, where do we see um, proportionate uh, outcomes uh, in, in American society? outside of American society, uh, today, yesterday, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, this whole notion that uh, we should see equal outcomes or more equal outcomes than we have today, uh, that that is the norm. And, and, and where we don't see it, you know, something nefarious, something fishy is going on, is a, is a premise uh, I, I, I would reject. Um, uh, unevenness in outcomes is the norm, and it's been the norm uh, down through down through history, not only here, but internationally, and not only today, but uh, uh, very you know for, for, for as long as is recorded history, uh, uh, as long as we've had recorded history, um, it, it, the and also again the, what's implied in, in that. Uh, to just to piggyback a little bit on what the professor was saying, that uh, the cause is, is discrimination, I think is problematic. Um, the the uh, 
the gap in per capita incomes between Eastern Europeans and Western Europeans is larger than the black white gap in America. And in Europe, you're talking about mostly Caucasians. Um, so, uh, so even in, 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 in areas of the world where you're, where you have more ethnic or racial homogeneity, you still get these disparities, uh, which suggests to me that, that something else, uh, uh, may be, may be driving them, or at least it suggests that we cannot automatically attribute this to, um, uh, to racism or disparity. Uh, or discrimination and, 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 and so forth. And, and that's one of the problems. You, in trying to use racism or racial discrimination um, as a causal factor, it's always been with us. It's human nature. Um, and, and so to say you see this gap due to racism, uh, when we've always had, had racism, but uh, certain groups have not always been ahead of other groups, it, it seems very problematic to me to, to point to race and to, to stop thinking past that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back a little bit here and, and play a little bit of, of, of a devil's advocate. Um, and one of the things I'm going to point to is, is some recent data that came out showing uh, that black immigrants uh, who don't have roots in the United States dating back, uh, you know, to legalized segregation, Jim Crow, and even back to slavery, uh, tend to have significantly better uh, economic outcomes. Doesn't that help make the case? that a lot of what we're seeing in the racial wealth gap is a function of the discrimination from the past? Um, Glenn, I'll throw that one to you first. No, I don't think so. I, I actually think it makes the case that these immigrants who are, by the way, not a random draw on the population, but a selected set of people who elected to pick themselves up and move tens of thousands of miles, maybe thousands of miles, certainly, in order to start a new life somewhere. They're very entrepreneurial. They're very, uh, you know, uh, a selective pe set of people. So I think that should be noted. But the other thing I think it says is they start businesses. I think it says that they become landlords. Uh, I think it says that they scramble and, and they create wealth. Their wealth, the immigrants' wealth, didn't fall from the sky. It didn't arrive as a check from the government and it wasn't an inheritance. They came here probably with very little and they made lives. And in the context of making their lives, they created wealth. So to call attention to the fact that immigrants create wealth at a greater rate than um, indigenous uh, domestic uh, populations of color or African-American populations is not necessarily to discredit the system of capitalism, which the immigrants have taken advantage of to further their lives. And it's certainly not to prove that discrimination accounts for the fact that African-Americans didn't start the businesses accumulate the resources and make their lives to the same extent. Everybody is operating within the same system here. Um, so I, I, I would not be at all persuaded by the observation that West Indian or West African immigrants to the United States are going to Ivy League colleges or are opening up bodegas on the corner or are uh, doing other business activities. I would rather take them as a model of what's possible to be done in this country and encourage my fellow African Americans to emulate them. So Jason, it sounds like like what Greg what, what what Glenn is saying is that capitalism actually gives us a way to close uh, the racial wealth gap to 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 make uh, you know something of ourselves and improve our economic standing, uh, you know, which raises a question about uh, sort of what 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 the racial wealth gap actually says about capitalism. So it, it, is Glenn right? Is is capitalism the answer here? Um, I, I would think you, you always have to ask the question compared to what. Um, you know, capitalism compared to what? Un under what other uh, system, uh, economic system, uh, do you see um, uh, the outcomes you'd rather see here in the U.S.? Where, in what country would blacks be better off than they are in America? Why are black Americans the richest black people on the planet? Um, so, so you, you have to say compared to what? Uh, and the other point I would make about the, the black immigrants, and, 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 and Professor Lowry is right, they're a self-selecting group. So we can only read so much into this, but uh, their children also uh, outperform. The second generation is outperforming um, uh, their fellow Black Americans. So um, uh, and 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 there, you know, there's no accent. Um, they, they look the same as I look or as Glenn looks, and 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 so they're facing the same discrimination that is used to explain. These gaps we're talking about, and and why are they why are they doing better? And I think uh, I would argue it has it has a, a lot to do with culture. 
um, and, 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 and we, can, we can talk about that, that human capital that they bring um, to the task. But um, uh, the other point I would make, again, this, this, this notion that, that, that racism can be this all-purpose explanation, this blanket explanation for these, for these disparities. We also have examples, and, and immigrants are just one of them, of, of an oppressed group uh, uh, rising above their oppressor economically. Um, you know, Japanese Americans uh, and, and Japanese Canadians were both discriminated against uh, and uh, severely discriminated against. And today they out earn white Americans and white Canadians. Uh, the same thing can be said uh, about Jews, not only in the U.S., but in any number of countries around the world. The formerly oppressed group um, uh, rising above uh, their oppressor uh, economically. And you can also make this case on the flip side. So for instance, the, the median household incomes of uh, you know, Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans uh, is lower than uh, the median household incomes of Blacks. Uh, I don't think anyone would argue that Mexican Americans and um, Puerto Ricans have been discriminated against more in the United States than Black people have. Um, so again, the, this, this, this assumption that, uh, that racism is this causal factor, I think we really, really need to, to question that. You, you can't, that's an assertion. That needs to be shown empirically. If you're going to make that argument, you have to bring some facts, uh, some data to that discussion. And I just see too many examples out there of oppressed groups um, not allowing that oppression uh, to keep them from rising economically if they get uh, some other things right. So, you know, what, what it sounds like you're saying is that there is something other than the systems and structures uh, in place in the United States that contributes at least to a significant degree to some of the, the wealth gaps and income gaps that we see, which begs the question, you know, what what is behind it? Is it culture? Is it uh, something else, um, you know, Glenn. What, what do you think? I mean, if, if capitalism and the structures in American society don't give us uh, a, a straight answer as to how to account for all of the racial wealth gap, um, what else could be behind it? Well, I would start with a basic accounting. I mean, people, you know, begin life with a certain inheritance. They, over the period of time, develop their skills. They go into the labor market. They start a business or whatever, and so they generate income. They have expenditures, and so the excess of income over expenditures is their savings, which accumulates through time. I wouldn't leave out government transfer programs. I think that's a huge problem with this uh, literature on wealth disparity, because Americans are entitled to Social Security. That's a part of our wealth. If you're thinking about an intertemporal decision problem of an individual who knows that they're going to be eligible to get Social Security after 65 or whatever, they can make their own decisions about saving, taking that uh, anticipated transfer into account. So that's part of their wealth. That's part of their overall lifetime uh, assets that's available to them. So when you compare people's wealth by group or whatever, you ought to include the uh, the discounted anticipated value of their uh, government transfers. But that's a, that's a side point. I'd have a basic arithmetic. People start with something, they add to it over time. It's the excess of their earnings over their, um, over their expenditures. Uh, they may make investments. They may engage in entrepreneurial activity. They may create wealth. At the end of the day, they accumulate over their lifetime. So what's the cause? It's going to be lower earnings because of discrimination against Blacks in the labor market throughout the 20th century. It's going to be lower starting point of inheritance because of the fact that the ancestors didn't have as much, and you can trace that back to slavery. But it's also going to be savings behavior, investment behavior, entrepreneurial behavior, and wealth creating behavior. And I would take all of those factors into account. We change the things that we can change. We can certainly change wealth creating behavior to the extent that we encourage people's entrepreneurial activity uh, prudently, wisely so. Um, and uh, we can uh, cultivate financial literacy and things of this kind. We can also engage in transfers, and I assume we'll get around to talking about that, whether or not reparations paid to Blacks is somehow a quote unquote solution to the quote unquote problem of uh, wealth disparities. But, but that's how I would begin. And I'd put a lot of emphasis on wealth creation. It's a dynamic problem. If you don't rectify racial disparities in wealth creation, transferring money between people at a point in time will only lead eventually to a reversion back to the disparity that's being generated by the fact that people are not creating wealth at the same rate. 
Again, I invite you to compare the Jews to the uh, Irish Catholics. I invite you to compare the Igbo to the House of Fulani in Nigeria. I invite you to compare the Chinese in uh, Indonesia or the Philippines or uh, Southeast Asia to uh, the indigenous populations of Malaysia or whatever it is. Uh, as Jason pointed out, groups differ in the capacities that they exhibit through their behavior to start businesses, engage in entrepreneurship, trading, and uh, finance, and create wealth for themselves. And those disparities are going to assert themselves unless the underlying behavioral differences between the groups is addressed. So, Jason, I, I want to I want to offer some pushback on 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 what Glenn just said. Um, is it is it possible that a function of those behaviors, that those behaviors are motivated by attitudes? Um, and doesn't it require a, a sort of positive attitude about operating and, and the chances that you'll have to operate within the capitalist system that, that informs the choices that people make? Um, and, and, and in that case, if that's true, does do we have a duty as, as, as defenders of capitalism uh, to address that, that sense that the system is illegitimate? Oh yes, you do. You you, you have to explain um, uh, free market capitalism to people, and and you have to continue explaining it uh, for every generation. It has to be a, a lesson relearned over and over and over again. I think. Um, uh, but it's it, you know if if your concern is uh, racial discrimination, um, you, you know, capitalism is your best friend, and 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 that has been. Because 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 capitalism puts a price on discriminating. It's not that capitalist systems are going to uh, you know rid society of racism. Again, I think that is human nature. I don't expect to live to see a day when racism has been vanquished from America, let alone uh, the planet. And um, but the question is, to what extent is it a barrier to black progress? To what extent does it explain? disparities in educational attainment or income or unemployment and so forth. And, um, and, and I think uh, capitalism is the best way to address that. You know, if, if you are a, a landlord who uh, doesn't want to rent to Jews uh, or blacks or Asians, you risk uh, having some vacant apartments for a longer period of time than some of your competitors. It's going to cost you. If, if you are an employer who doesn't want to hire certain minority groups who may work for less and they go somewhere else to work, uh, you're going to pay for that. You're, you're, th th those inefficiencies are going to catch up with you. They're going to eat into your profit margins. So again, uh, it exacts a price. And, 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 and that has long been the case, whether you're talking about the labor market, you know, you always have the Jackie Robinson example in the world of sports, mm -hmm. so breaking the color barrier back in 1947 with the Brooklyn Dodgers, then uh, they they get a few more black players in a couple of years. They have a competitive advantage now. If other if other uh, teams aren't going to dip into this pool of talent, uh, they will be at a competitive disadvantage against the Brooklyn Dodgers. And guess what? Uh, they wanted to be competitive. You know, the, the same thing happened in academia, where you know you had a time before World War II when uh, Jewish academics would not be hired by elite colleges. Then World War II happens, there's a labor shortage in college professors. So a few elite schools do hire a couple Jewish professors. Then others need to hire them to, to keep up. And now Jews are overrepresented <laughs> at elite uh, colleges uh, among uh, professors. So, so you see this in, in all aspects uh, of, of the capitalist system. And, and, and that's what uh, capitalism offers that other, that other economic systems do not offer. And, and, and we've seen that time again, uh, both in the US and in, and in other places. And I think that is the lesson that needs to be taught uh, when, we are, um, when we are trying to you know, make the case for, uh, for why our system uh, works better than others. Can I add something, Rafael? Sure. Uh, just very quickly on the legitimacy question, because I think it really is a very important question. But the so-called racial wealth gap it's not where the rubber meets the road on the legitimacy of capitalism and wealth question. It's the super billionaires and their uh, wealthy influence over American political affairs, which undermines people's sense of the legitimacy of the capitalist system, the ability of people with great wealth to, uh, you know, uh, in effect, import that uh, uh, influence into uh, other realms of public affairs. 
uh, that I think is a threat uh, to uh, the general sense of legitimacy. But uh, as I say, the existence of ethnic disparities in wealth holdings is, uh, is very commonplace and very widespread. Um, I guess we'll talk about reparations in due course. And I think that's another legitimacy question, but um, I, I have my views about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I think first what I'll, what I'll just give you an opportunity to respond to is what Jason said, this idea that capitalism, you know, sort of exacts a price for discrimination. I mean, is, is there something to that? And, and are there other systems? Well, that wait a minute, is there something better? to that? Is there something to that? That's one of the basic insights of economic analysis. That the, the, the idea... What is discrimination? Discrimination is paying some for less uh, than what a person is worth. Dis discrimination is treating equally productive objects differently. Have you heard of arbitrage? I know you have heard of arbitrage. Arbitrage is where you buy low and you sell high. When you have a worker whose value is 100, but who happens to be black and the employer only wants to pay him 80, there's somebody else who figures out that the difference between 80 and 100 is 20. It's 20. And you can make that money by closing that gap. That's why the Republic of South Africa had to instantiate laws forbidding private companies from employing black workers in certain occupations in order to enforce apartheid. Because left to their own devices, left to their own devices, those companies would have maximized their bottom line by picking up the dollar bills lying on the ground, which is what discrimination creates. So um, I think there's just a deep misunderstanding about how markets work in the, in the context of, uh, of discrimination and disparities. Markets don't care about the color of people's skin. They make you, if you do care about the color of their skin, pay for caring about the color of their skin. And it's only by impeding market processes that governments have been able to sustain for a long period of time regimes of overt discrimination. Yeah. yeah. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and it, and it it, I think, leads us naturally into the next question, which is, you know, you talked about reparations, and that's one of the things that's been sort of thought of as a way forward. So if capitalism isn't the driver of this, if it has the ability uh, to get people uh, to where they want to be on the, on the socioeconomic ladder, uh, is there something we should be thinking of, of doing to speed that process up? Or is this just something that has to sort of take its natural course? Jason, what do you think? Well, I don't think there are, I think the key to speeding this up is the development of, of what economists call human capital, uh, a, a group's development of skills and habits and behaviors and attitudes and saving propensities. Um, uh, that is what ultimately uh, will, will, will move a group from poverty to prosperity. And uh, I don't think there are any shortcuts to the, that self-development. And, 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 and too often, I think, uh, the government, uh, particularly here in the United States with respect to Black Americans, um, has interfered with that self-development. And uh, there have been unintentional consequences uh, for, that, for that interference. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the civil rights movement's greatest achievement to me was getting the government off the backs of Blacks particularly in the South with the Jim Crow laws. Where the government has gotten into trouble is when it tries to help blacks through say the war on poverty or affirmative action and so forth. That's where you're getting, you're, you're getting into trouble. And, and the, the more you know, socialist leaning uh, left politicians and, 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 and activists, I think, err in their assumption that the, the focus on helping the underclass should be redistribution of wealth rather than wealth creation for that group. Um, and, and that's when you, when you get into something like reparations, I see it as just another huge wealth redistribution scheme. And why, sh why would we expect it to work or be any more effective than the ones we've been trying for the past 50 or 60 years in this country? Uh, we, we've, we've tried this already and, and, and we see the results and I don't expect, uh, reparation, the results of reparation be any different. So Glenn, what, what about that? I mean, you know, it, is, there, is there a space between the sort of modern idea of, of reparations and, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, government transfer programs that we saw really get built up over the 60s and 70s? Or, or is there something right. to the and, idea and, and that you want to talk about? You want to talk about solutions to the racial wealth gap? Let, let, me, let me mention three. Baby bonds. So this is the inverse of social security. Everybody gets an entitlement at the beginning of their life. Maybe they don't get control of it until they turn 21. 
but the Federal Reserve creates an account for everybody and everybody gets uh, $10,000 or $50,000 or whatever that's pledged that will be available to them when they turn. And that's paid for by taxation on the wealthy. Uh, that's one kind of program. Uh, minority business enterprise development. This is where government procurement and private sector procurement is directed to companies that are owned by minorities, uh, owners, uh, entrepreneurs, and stimulate the development of their businesses in that way and thereby hopefully generate wealth in the hands of minority owners. And then finally, reparations where a debt is acknowledged by the government for historical exploitation and mistreatment of black people and money is handed over. Now, with respect to baby bonds, I think there's a case that can be made for it. I mean, it might not be at the top of my list of policies, but I think you could make a case that in a country where wealth inequality is skewed and where you're concerned about technological displacement of people and uh, going forward and nobody has enough money to buy themselves basic housing and so forth, you could make a case. It's a you know left of center initiative to be sure, but I think a respectable case can be made in the spirit of universal basic income, but slightly different about endowing um, American citizens at the start of life with an entitlement that would give them something above zero to to uh, to start their lives with. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating it, but I'm saying I think it, it passes minimal muster in terms of uh, coherence and uh, a, a kind of a moral case that could be made. Uh, minority business enterprise development, I think, has been deeply problematic. Uh, I, I'm sure that Jason has probably written a story about this. I don't know if you have or you haven't about the fraud problems in minority business enterprise development programs. If you haven't, somebody at the Wall Street Journal has, uh, because they have been serious problems. Um, and and you could, I don't know about evaluations of uh, minority business enterprise development efforts over the 40 or 50 years that they've been, as to how many black millionaires can you point to and how much wealth uh, creation. I am myself much more inclined toward trying to boost the earnings power of rank and file black people and allowing their uh, levels of incomes to be higher through human capital oriented strategies than cherry picking a few people who happen to own uh, companies and 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 boosting their sales um but i you know I, I could be i could be wrong about that on reparations i'll just say very briefly i think it's a terrible idea to talk about you know you got 40 million african americans if it's a hundred thousand dollars a head or whatever that might be a high number i don't know is four trillion dollars. Um, when the US government decided to pay reparations to the Japanese victims of internment in camps during World War II, this was a piece of legislation signed into law by President Ronald Reagan. Um, the amount paid was $20,000 a head and the number of people receiving it who had actually been interred in camps, not their descendants, was 80,000 people, that's $6 billion. So the Japanese reparations was $1.6 billion. Um, a reasonable estimate on American reparations to blacks, uh, 40 acres in a mule would be in the matter, uh, would be in the trillions. That's a social security magnitude fiscal program defined in terms of the racial identity of American citizens. It's a horrible idea. It's South Africa-like. Uh, we don't want to go down that road. We don't want to endow citizens with entitlements based upon their race. I doubt very seriously if such a thing could get through the United States Supreme Court, although I'm not an attorney. But I have another reason for thinking reparations is a terrible idea. You racialize uh, the public obligation to take care of the needy and the poor in the black ghettos of this country. Do you think those ghettos are going to go away uh, once reparations is announced? Do you think that the behavioral problems that generate those ghettos are going to go away. I'm talking about failing schools and poorly educated kids. I'm talking about broken families. I'm talking about criminal behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think it's going to go away? It's not going to go away. However, African Americans will have monetized, commodified, and cashed out our entitlement to the sympathetic engagement with our problems of the American polity by sitting at a bargaining table and putting our patch on the table and pushing it across for a bunch of chits. It's a horrible way of thinking about the relationship between black people and our country. You owe me, because the answer to you owe me is you Negroes have been paid. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that, that's, that's a pretty strong case you make there. And, and as much as I wanna bring Jason in to, to react to that, I think we're sort of at the point in our program where we wanna open things up to some Q and A. So I wanna bring 
uh, Greg back on to introduce the uh, the student chapter leaders uh, who are going to ask those questions, as I understand it. Yes, thank you, Ralph. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, first up, we'd like to bring on uh, Tim back from our Questrom chapter to uh, kick things off for us. i um, going to ask your first question. Um, our speakers will address that, then uh, ask your second question, please. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys, for sharing uh, today. Uh, my first question is, um, you know, many communities of color who have been in this country for generations have had some of the barriers to wealth building that you've discussed today. Uh, my question is, how do more recent immigrants fare in today's society? And how, do, uh, how does the flow of legal and illegal immigrants affect uh, the challenges uh, facing, faced by the communities of color today? Who's uh, Jason? Major. You want to start with that one? Uh, sure. Uh, let's say a couple things about it. In, in terms of um, uh, how recent immigrants are faring, I think uh, f from what I've read, the uh, to the extent that people have complained that the uh, and we didn't really get into this in the previous discussion, but maybe we should have. When I look at a wealth at, 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 the, at, the, at the wealth gap or the and, and, and break it down by by race. I'm much more interested in in in, in seeing mobility between the different you know earning income quintiles that we use. So um, you know if you start out on that lower 20 percent, do you do you wind up there? Um, uh, or if you start out in, in 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 the you know in the middle, are you falling? Or are you rising over time? Is is there movement in between? In between these um, the, these the, 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 the quintiles that we used uh, to measure income in, in, in America, and um, from the evidence I've seen is with immigrants you still see that that movement. Uh, yes, a lot of poor ones come here, but um, they they do better and their children do better. Um, now that's going to you know vary between different immigrant groups, but uh, on balance I think that is what what we see. We still see upper mobility. Uh, among immigrants, and uh, and that's what we that's what we want to see, and and to some extent we see it more th than we've been seeing it in the um, in the native population, and and which tells me, um, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not capitalism, <laughs> it's it's how different different groups bring certain skills and attitudes and behaviors uh, uh, to capitalism. And, and, and thrive or don't thrive accordingly. But there's nothing I, I think inherently wrong with the system itself as measured that way. Um, in terms of, and I don't know if you were getting at competition between immigrants and, and, uh, and US workers, or particularly the um, uh, uh, less skilled, uh, lower income US workers and how that affects uh, the wealth gap. But if, if you were, um, I'm, I'm not very persuaded uh, by, by that argument, uh, which is a, a sort of, um, we need to limit uh, immigration, particularly of low-skill workers, because they'll be competing with low-skill American workers, and uh, we want those, those jobs and those opportunities to go to those, those, um, those low-skill Americans. Um, I, I don't see it as a fixed pie. Um, I don't see it as a zero-sum uh, labor market situation there. Um, and I, I also have seen some pretty good evidence going back a long, a long ways that the immigrants who do come here tend to compete mostly with one another and, and not with natives for, for jobs. Uh, we're not importing clones of ourselves. Um, immigrants tend to come here, that come here tend to either have, you know, uh, uh, higher levels of education than uh, the average American and higher skills or lower levels of education and lower skills than the average American. So they tend to more complement our labor markets than to elbow aside uh, native workers, and so I don't, I don't see uh, immigration as posing a, a problem in, in that sense. Glenn, any thoughts on that? Agree, disagree? Yeah, well, I'm, I don't know that I entirely agree with Jason in the following sense: um, if there's a labor shortage uh, and there are undeveloped people laying around, employers will have a tremendous incentive to cultivate these undeveloped people so as to make them fit for employment. If the employer's option is to uh, go offshore in the face of a labor shortage, they don't have the same incentive. Uh, schools are not working very well in many American communities. They are failing to develop the human potential of the people who live there. This is not a good thing. It's a crisis for the country regardless of immigration. 
It's a less severe crisis of the country, perhaps you could argue, uh, to some degree in virtue of the fact that uh, the need for uh, the labor can be satisfied by importing immigrants. I'm not against immigration. I don't want to be misunderstood. This is a question of what the causal consequence in uh, Southern California of a large number of workers, some documented, some not, not, not documented with relatively low skills, who are prepared to work in hotel and restaurant and furniture manufacture and uh, textiles and whatnot at wages that are near the minimum wage and under the conditions such as what those conditions are. Uh, that's a good thing for somebody who owns one of those factories. It might not be a good thing for somebody who's six generations American who lives in a housing project somewhere, who went to a school that didn't work very well, and who needs to be um, brought into the modern economic engine uh, in a manner that's suitable with the skills that they actually have, which might make them uh, well suited for relatively low skilled work in textile or hotel and uh, retail uh, 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 commercial work or something, things of this kind, jobs that are filled by immigrants. So, can I, so, can I, can I get back and can I? Can yeah, I, please, uh, let's, let's, let's go back and forth. I would just want to say quickly, we've had some natural experiments with this. Um, I mean, there, there have been economists, uh, Richard Vetter is one, a labor economist, uh, Ohio University, who has looked at uh, rates of employment uh, and, and, and rates of immigration going back over the entire 20th century. And, and higher rates, I should say lower rates of, of uh, uh, unemployment in America correlate uh, pretty consistently with higher rates of immigration. Um, uh, so, so we have some, you know, we, we, we do have some, some data on this. So the other point I would make, and this is a more recent example I could point to, um, you, you know, there, there are upwards of 12, 13, 14 million illegal immigrants in the country right now. Um, some people claim there are as many as 20 million. So pick your number. What I would yeah. say is pre-COVID, what was the unemployment rate in this country? Three, three point five percent. It was low. 4%? Yeah, it was really so low. Who's, whose jobs were they stealing? Who, who was being displaced? We had a labor shortage in this country uh, prior to COVID. No matter how many illegal immigrants you think were here, um, there, there, there were there were uh, a million more job openings than there were people looking for work. So. Well, I, I think that's that's. I think we need, we need to factor that in before we talk about. In the last example I'll give, and this gets back to culture, a cultural point, uh, Glenn, that I think you'd appreciate, which is, you know, anyone who lives near a you know a Home Depot, uh, and and needs uh, you know some, somebody to 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 help them move some furniture or paint their garage or something, can go over there and find. Um, uh, a bunch of Hispanic men looking for work in that parking lot. Do you think if we deported those people tomorrow, you could go over there next week and you'll find, say, black men waiting in the parking lot to do these jobs? I don't think so. Well, Glenn, Glenn um, I'm going to give you a, a minute so to respond. And then I, I think we, to other we, questions. we need to be, you know, I, 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 well, think, I mean, think about what you did. No, ahead, I, what you're saying, what I'm saying, and I think this they're not inconsistent with one another. I think you're saying there's work uh, to be done here and uh, the domestic born African-American unskilled workers don't wanna do it. And so we're availing ourselves of the, of the alternative at hand. And that's true. And what I'm saying is if that alternative at hand weren't at hand, the pressure would be on politically, socially and economically, the private sector and the public sector to do what needs to be done in order to develop that young project dwelling African-American uh, uh, person uh, so that they would be willing to stand out in front of the Home Depot and, and take the job. I mean, I, you know, I, but I'm not against the, the I'm, I'm against people walking across the border without authorization. I'm against that. But I'm not against the idea that people seek better lives and that they're willing to do jobs that other people wouldn't do. Uh, I'm thinking that. All right, gentlemen, to I'm going to. Yeah, I, should, I have to stop. Okay. Yeah, no the problem, interest of, uh, just getting to the other questions. I'm sorry, Joe. This is a very interesting conversation, but uh, I know we've got some other questions to get asked. So, um, Tim, go ahead. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for your your spirited responses. I really, I'm really enjoying this. Um, so, my second question um, is, if I could maybe shorten it. So, 
Um, you know, sometimes capitalism can be vilified in popular culture, like movies or TV shows. Uh, but as supporters of free markets, you know, one of the things that could address this distaste could be education uh, and empower empowerment of people to to help them understand how they thrive in this system, in this capitalist system. Um, do you feel like that education is one of the strongest influences there? And in what ways could you help? Uh, in what ways do you think this education for wealth building could be most effective? You, you Glenn, we'll start with you. You got a. Uh... You can take it, Glenn. I got, you got yeah, I'm sorry, though. I couldn't understand what Tim was saying because of the audio. So can, can you the, repeat the, the question, Raphael? The, the question is, do you feel that, that, that education is, is one of the stronger influences in terms of helping prepare new generations uh, to build their wealth? And, and you know, in what ways should we be thinking about making education sort of a, an effective uh, vehicle uh, to developing that, uh, that you know, wealth building capacity? Gosh, I do think education is critical. I've been following the work of James Heckman, uh, the economist at the University of Chicago, early childhood development and stuff like that. Um, I think what goes on in households is critical even before they get to school. Uh, I think preschool education can probably supplement what families are able to do for three, four and five year olds before they begin school. Um, I, I think everybody doesn't go to college. I think vocational education could be important. I, I think perhaps you ought to we ought to be uh, more focused on trying to encourage uh, people completing high school to consider uh, uh, programs of uh, development that equip them with marketable skills right away through cooperative engagement with industry and community colleges and things of this kind. So I think education is important, but I want to defend capitalism. Can I just, I mean, because uh, the alternative, I, I mean, just reiterate what uh, Jason said earlier, compared to what? Uh, Capitalism compared to what? I mean, you don't, you know, uh, the uh, uh, alternatives have not shown themselves to be very uh, effective in terms of creating vital uh, economic uh, systems that allow uh, disadvantaged people to advance. So I just had to get that in. I I appreciate that, and I appreciate Tim for the two thoughtful questions. Uh, and I think our next questioner is is uh, Joe, who I want to bring on um, to pose his first question. Joe, welcome. Thanks, Raphael, um, and thank you both for being here. This has been super interesting. So my my first question is, is sort of a pushback on on um, what Dr. Lowry just said about in the defense of capitalism is that you know the wealth disparity now is basically equal to what it was in 1968 um, during the civil rights era, and so given the lack of progress we've had over the past 70 years. Um, what, what gives you hope or, or, or why are we to think that um, going forward, the, a market system is going to um, really change anything? Uh, Joe, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I, I, I dispute the premise of the question. Lack of progress? Oh, come on, there's been plenty of progress in the last 50 years. You say the relative wealth gap, I assume that's the ratio of the wealth of the median black household to the median white household. And that's a number, whatever it is, 0.1, let's say. And is that what you mean? And when you say it hasn't changed over this period of time, um, I, I've already offered my concerns about measuring disparities in populations by looking at ratios of medians, especially in samples where there are a lot of zeros or negative numbers. Uh, the, these medians are in no way an, a good assessment of the wealth that's available to, uh, to the entire population of households. Um, it's so, I mean, but again, that's a, that's kind of a technical measurement point. There has been progress in the last, last 50 years is what I want to say. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm sure home ownership has increased substantially for all these populations over the 50 year period that we're talking about. Jason said this in passing, but it warrants to be reiterated. reiterated. African-Americans are by far the richest population of people descended from African uh, on the planet. Uh, Nigeria has almost 200 million people and its GDP is less than $1 trillion a year. African-Americans are 40 million max. And we've got what, 10%, 8% of a $20 trillion economy in terms of our income flow. We're, so we're, we're, we're much more prosperous than most black people on the planet, which may not be saying very much since wealth in Africa, you know, people are poor. But uh, there has been progress. And I certainly don't think capitalism is to blame. Uh, you know, 
private ownership of the means of production, a stock market, uh, people owning their assets. Uh, that's the problem. We're going to collectivize. Do you think a politically administered distribution of the national economy would work to the favor of black people? Uh, the black poor? Uh, I have serious doubts about that. So that, that's my response. All right. Joe, another question? Yeah, definitely. Um, and thanks for that response. Um, my other question is, is about COVID-19, obviously a, uh, a, a big issue today. Um, so the COVID outbreak has, has affected Black Americans disproportionately hard. Uh, we've seen rates of COVID infection and deaths that are higher in counties with higher than above average uh, Black populations. And we've also seen Black Americans are most likely to feel adverse economic impacts caused by the disease. So moving forward, how do we balance, um, you know, interventionist approaches using public funds to address some of these public health issues while at the same time promoting market-based solutions? Well, um, I think I think we've been talking a lot about the the disproportionate health problems. Uh, the black community's disproportionate health problems related to COVID, uh, but I think that's mainly a function of, of um, you know their their preconditions and uh, pre uh, health conditions, pre-existing health conditions in these communities already, um, and then also partly based on you know what what types of jobs they have, service sector jobs where they're interacting with the public. You have a lot of multi-generational households in the black community, uh, grandmothers uh, raising kids, uh, raising grandkids and so forth. Uh, so, th so they had, th a lot of that was, was going on. Um, uh, but I, I think that what's been un underplayed a little bit is the extent to which the lockdowns have hurt um, these communities. Uh, the, the, you know, these folks can't work from home like uh, like like a lot of us can, um, uh, you know, they're, they're delivering the Amazon uh, uh, products and the UPS deliveries and, and and the groceries and the dry cleaning and, and, and so forth. And and I think when you go back to if you want an appreciation of how devastating economically COVID has been, you, you need to go back to this pre COVID economy that this country was enjoying and how uh, these minority groups were faring. You, you saw record low unemployment rates uh, among Blacks and Hispanics. You saw record low poverty rates among Blacks and Hispanics. You saw wages rising faster for these groups than for uh, their bosses and management. Um, you, saw, you saw a reduction in income inequality. Uh, all that stopped with the lockdown and um, uh, and I think the impacts, you know, there are, are going to be felt for years to come. And, uh, you know, the, a little bit has been made of how well um, or how much better uh, President Trump fared with the black vote, but particularly with black men uh, last week in the election. And I think it had a lot to do with his emphasis on reopening the economy. Uh, these these folks had really been hurting. Uh, under under uh, President Obama, you know, you know the, the, the unemployment rate for blacks did not fall below double digits until the seventh year of his presidency. Uh, there are a lot of black people who remember how, how tough things were back then. And in recent years, they have been much, much better. And, 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 the, and the lockdown uh, was, was a real gut punch to these communities. Well, thanks for that, Jason. And thanks for those great questions, Joe. I wanna bring Steve on. Uh, um, and we're in the interest of time. I want to, uh, you know, approach his questions as a, a bit of a lightning round. So we'll try and uh, keep our answers uh, to sixty seconds, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, get them in under time. So, Steve, thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, so we we have seen different policies to encourage investment and development in poorer communities. The most recent iteration being opportunity zones. But we also know there is a potential for these policies to accelerate gentrification and facilitate wealth extraction. 
In your opinion, what are the best solutions to empower these communities while also preventing displacement and gentrification? So Glenn, why don't you take a crack at that at this point? Well, you're tying my hands now. You want me to prevent the gentrification and you want me to develop the community. You want nobody to be displaced and yet you want economic development. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm uh, walking around with an 80 pound weight on my back trying to do a hurdles. Um, what's so, let me just be very clear about it. And I apologize for this because I'm challenging the question. What's so bad about gentrification? What's so bad about displacement? I say that with respect. You've got space, you've got economy, and you've got people. The people happen to be living in a space, the value of which could be significantly enhanced through economic development, but it would be different people living there. People were prepared to take that old building, convert it into loft apartments, uh, open up high-end wine uh, bars on the corner and uh, markets and so forth and cater to people who value living very close to the business district in uh, the architecture that's there relative to a population that is incumbent to the area uh, over many decades of decay, happen to be living in housing that's run down with rents that are low. Why would I assume that the solution to the development problem needs to respect the constraint that nobody be displaced. Displacement is not the worst thing in the world. Displacement is the way of the world, Steve. Jason, what do you think? I, I completely agree with that. And in terms of these development schemes, I, 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 the history of affirmative action with, in, in, in this respect is that uh, the, 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 the blacks who are better off uh, usually take advantage of these programs. They're always, they're always pitched as helping poor blacks, but they seldom do. They, they help um, blacks who are already well off become better off. And, and I think that's what, 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 you'll, see, what you'll see happen uh, with these schemes going forward. Can I just right. add something? Because I don't want to leave it there. When you displace the people because those loft apartments and those wine bars were generating much more economic value, you don't just push them aside and don't worry about them. You make sure they have the housing voucher or other support that they need to be able to secure decent accommodations and some alternative scenario. Some of the surplus that you generate from the enhanced development, which leads to displacement, can be allocated to cushioning the fall for people who have to bear the brunt of that displacement. Oh, so, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in favor of cold-blooded, heartless, cap, you know, withering, <laughs> cut down all the trees, capitalism. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, that's really <laughs> well good that that ought to be a nice lead into your last question steve yeah yeah and, uh thanks um I, my last question was related to reparations i think glenn you, you provided a a spirited response i was curious to get jason's uh thoughts on on this reparations question um you know it, you know in various forms have been raised as a solution to help the injustices of slavery Loss can be viewed as a redistribution of wealth. The century of free, free labor can be interpreted to represent a significant debt owed to African Americans. You know, well, we well, have well, all to play for reparations that aligns with free market ideals. If so, what form of value should reparations be returned to African Americans? Uh, I, I like to defer to uh, something um, uh, a friend and, and mentor of mine, uh, Glenn knows well, Shelby Steele once said. In this area, and and uh, Shelby Steele's a race scholar at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and he once wrote that um, suffering can be endured and overcome; it cannot be repaid. And and that's sort of the view I take with with respect to, to to slavery reparations. All the slaves are dead. All the slave owners are dead. I don't think guilt can be inherited. Um, and 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 that's my 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 problem philosophically. With, with this approach. And then there's just the practical side. Uh, you know, I, I, I dispute a lot of these numbers being used uh, to argue that, um, uh, you know, Americans' economic wealth was, was built on slavery. Um, the South was uh, the poorest region uh, of the country during slavery, continues to be after slavery. And that's due, and, and that's true where slavery existed in Europe. It's true where slavery existed in, 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 in the West Indies and Brazil and so forth. Um, if, if, so I, I really have a, a problem with some of these arguments uh, that are made uh, in favor of reparations. And then there's just you know the, the very pragmatic matter of, of how you go about doing it. 
um, um, given that you know all, all the slaves are gone and all the slave owners are gone without some serious pushback uh, from the other side. I, I don't think it solves anything. And at the end of the day, it is simply a wealth redistribution scheme. And, and the focus needs to be on wealth creation, not wealth redistribution, if we're going to, uh, to move forward and, and help these groups that we want to help. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for those great questions. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Big uh, Greg Menken back on uh, to close us out. Greg? Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Professor Lowry, Jason Riley, and Rafael Mangual. Thank you to our student chapters for being involved this evening. Uh, that was a wonderful, fascinating, interesting discussion. Um, once again, if you're interested in learning more about the Adam Smith Society, would like to become a member, support the work that we're doing, please visit us at adamsmithsociety.com. I invite you all to visit. Stay tuned for future events. Thank you, everyone, again, for putting this event together, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much.